How's it going? I am Dylan. This is my cousin Carlo. This is All You Can Board. And we've got a little bit of a different kind of video today. So uh, I think within the last month, I saw a video over on uh, by the folks over at Dice Tower, and they did their top 10 video games of all time. And I thought, you know what? We need to do this because we grew up playing video games. When we started All You Can Board, it was in our description, like rooted in video games, like a lot of our board gaming history. And the reason we probably gravitate towards board gaming was because we fell in love with uh, video games first, you know. Yeah. So and played a lot of them together growing totally. up as well, right? Yeah. So it's 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 uh, I think a great topic for us to kind of talk about and talk about our top ten video games of all time because really all you can board wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our love of video games. Yeah. And this is really kind of like a little bit of a history and insight into our background, our history. Um, so I think this will be a fun topic to talk about. So a, a couple things uh, we're gonna do a bit of an intro, just talking about like our uh, you know what we which consoles we grew up with, which games we grew up with, and maybe not the game specific because they might give some of that yeah. stuff away, but uh, uh, just kind of to give you guys a little bit of background of our video, video game history. And then as well, I'm gonna, we're going to kind of spend just a really brief amount of time just talking about what you can expect from our list in terms of like genres and stuff like that. If there's yeah. or consoles in terms of like, you know, if, if you never played any games from, from one console specifically, then people will know not to expect any games. Of yeah. Them, right? yeah. So I'll throw it over to you first and you can start things off. Sure. Okay. So I've kind of been uh, like a Nintendo gamer almost all my life. I grew up with like my brother had a reg NES like since I can remember my earliest memories, maybe like age four or five. I remember getting a Super Nintendo with Street Fighter 2 when I was like five years old. So like m a really big chunk of my gaming was Nintendo and Super Nintendo. I still have those with like pretty big collections at home. Um, and then I bought like pretty much every Nintendo console for a while. So Nintendo 64, GameCube, and Nintendo Wii. Um, Nintendo Wii was the last console I bought though. So that was like from Zellers back when that still existed in Canada. So it was probably like, I think you said 2006, right? 2006, yeah. So yeah, it's like been over 15 years since I've bought a new console. I'm Might long over- 2007, I can't remember now. Okay, yeah, somewhere for now, some right. reason I thought it was earlier, but yeah, maybe that was, yeah, maybe that must've been GameCube. Yeah. But um, I'm long overdue to get like a Nintendo Switch and there, I briefly did own like a PlayStation and a PlayStation 2 and even an Xbox 360, but I didn't play those a whole lot. But um, I know you had some of those and I played them through you. So, um, and then PC gaming has been where most of my like newer games, I guess, have been over the last while. But uh, yeah, I, I, since falling in love with board games, like what, 15-ish years ago, I really like, I haven't played anywhere near as many video games. So uh, yeah, only one of the games on my top 10 here has been released in the last 20 years. Everything else is wow. more than 20 years nice. old. Uh, so a trip down down memory lane. A lot of yeah. this is nostalgia, which we'll probably talk about for a moment uh, before we get into picks as well. But um, yeah, why don't you tell them about your history yeah. a bit? So yeah, I, I think I, I have memories playing like the NES so, like way back and stuff like that. But my first real memories were Super Nintendo. And and so like a lot of my, my core memories are from Super Nintendo specifically. And then I would say that I, from then on, I almost ended up in one way or another owning almost every video game console that came out. Like, especially when I could start yeah. buying them myself. Like, I have tons of memories with the original PlayStation, one of my favorite consoles of all time. Same with PlayStation 2. I've owned PlayStation 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah. Um, I've had the Super Nintendo, the N64, GameCube, Wii, DS, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. Yeah, I was gonna like, say, you had all the DS, handhelds, which I never yeah, had, yeah. The Switch, so I've, I've owned every console. I, Xboxes I've owned, but I can't really say that there's many like standout memories. I was never a Halo guy. I'm not really a big shooter guy. So, um, you know, you won't see as many titles or if any on, on my list from there. Yeah. But I will say that, yeah, I've kind of, kind of, I've kind of been all over the gamut, but the biggest ones for me uh, are the original PlayStation and Super Nintendo. Those are my two favorite consoles of all time. And you may see a number of titles from those here. Okay, quick question, actually. Mm -hmm. How approximately, just top your head guess, how many games do you think you have in your Steam library and how many of them do you think you have played? In my Steam library, mm -hmm. my Steam library is not huge. I think okay. I think there are some in there that I was given for free and things like that. So I think I might be at like somewhere between eighty and hundred, or sixty and hundred, or something like that. Um, and I would say that there's probably a handful I haven't played, but most of them I've at least booted up and tried. Okay. So yeah, not well, a ton. I know I have some people on my, on my friends list that I know that have like eight hundred games yeah. in their Steam libraries. So. People uh, fall victim to those Steam sales. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I probably have like thirty or forty in my Steam library, but about half I haven't played yet. So yeah, there's a bunch sitting there that I really want to get to one day. Yeah. But why don't you mention real quick just like how I think we were talking about like these lists more than any board game list we've done on the channel I think really um, come down to like nostalgia and are very personal like yeah. You know, you're not going to see necessarily as much overlap with like the common best games of all time lists. Like some yeah. of these are very specific to us. I mean, some of them are widely regarded as the greatest yeah, games I would ever. Say I that think, but there are some in mind that like for sure would make you know, or I would know would make top of all time lists and stuff like that. But I, yeah, almost all of them I have some sort of nostalgic tie to. It's hard for me not to. It's hard for me to separate nostalgia with video games because. Yeah video games as a as a medium was so important to me growing up and it still mm -hmm. is as an escape and you know when you're stressed things like that that like the games that resonate with me are the ones that I find replayable and that I had some sort of joy of and I end up 
inherently having nostalgia with. Right. But I did try to, you know, not be too biased towards older games and look at some newer ones and say, yes, even if I don't have the full nostalgic tie to it now, I can recognize how good it was, and in 10, 20 years, maybe I will kind of thing. Yeah, so. especially if you're eager to revisit it or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and cool. I will just say one uh, last thing. What you can kind of expect from my list is I'm a huge RPG fan, so you can mm. definitely expect at least, or I would say more than one RPG on this list, uh, and, and the consoles that I uh, mentioned, like Super Nintendo and uh, PlayStation, I think are going to get their due in this list because those are my two favorite consoles. Okay, yeah, um, yeah and, for, and for me, it was almost the opposite. There aren't many of those, like especially turn-based RPGs, RPGs. There are certain ones that I really liked, but didn't play anywhere near as many of them as you. Yep. For me, a lot of it was like the side-scrolling platformer games that were like NES, Super Nintendo, yep. um, with some online games from PC and stuff. That anyways, yep. I don't want to spoil too much from the list, but okay, uh, I'll kick it off. How about that? Absolutely. Okay, go okay so I'm going to go with my number ten. This is probably the newest game on the list, um, and it is a game I don't know if you've even heard of. I might have explained it to you one time. I can't remember. And that is a game called Outer Wilds. Oh, okay. so yep. Outer Wilds. Uh, I went back and forth between this what it was at number 11 trying to flip them around and number 11 was a game from like 2005 and I wanted to put it on but I need to give Outer Wild its due because this is a game that I think is so brilliant in so many ways um, I don't I, I have to say minim, minimal stuff here because this is a game that you need to go in blind or not fully blind but you can't go in with much knowledge so what I will say is that it, it's kind of similar to a book I just read to be honest uh, the entire game is something that when you sit down to play, you don't know what's going on. And the entire game technically only lasts like 27 minutes. But you have what? to keep doing that 27 minute loop over and over and over again. Yeah, but okay. the more knowledge that you uncover every time, the different things you're going to do and the different ways you're going to approach it to the point where you can only play this game once because once you actually beat it, now when you boot it up, you can just beat it in 27 minutes every time because you know exactly what to go do to beat it. So I feel like I've already heard too much about this yeah. game. <laughs> so I don't want to say, I'm not going to say anything else about it because this is, the, this is the one I just don't want to spoil. But I will say that if you really just sit down and have the time to invest in this game, to get immersed in the world, it ties music in with it in a really cool way and it's just... It's such a, an amazing experience to figure out the, the, the puzzles and the, the what's going on in the world and, and the secrets and everything on your own. And when you see it all come together, it's one of the most satisfying games and, and conclusions. And uh, not even that the ending is itself is so good, but just having finished it, I kind of just sat back and went, man, like if I had played this when I was like 13, this might have been a game where I'm like, this is my favorite game of all time. Wow. Just because then I'd have even more nostalgia as being a kid experiencing it, right? right. So yeah, one of my favorite games uh, of, the, of the last little bit, I, I think it's a phenomenal game. If you have not heard of it or have not played it, don't look anything else up. Just get it when it's on sale or something or just go buy it now and just invest the time into it. I don't think you'll be disappointed. I mean, not, it's not for everybody. I, I think I don't think it landed with Brayden as much to do with me if I remember correctly, mm. but I, yeah, I absolutely love this game. Okay, it's funny you say this because I just heard about this game for the first time like yesterday or the day before when I was looking through some best games of all time list to refresh my memory to make sure I wasn't missing anything. Yeah. And this is one of the ones I was telling you before we turned on the camera that I immediately added it to my Steam <laughs> wish list and was like, I don't want to talk to anyone about this game yeah. because I don't want to hear anything about it, but I, yeah. it's a must play for me, oh, like, have to play. I, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so good. And, and as for the question, would it work as a board game? I mean, I love the idea of a board game that you can only play. I mean, it's kind of like a campaign game that way, but where you have to like play the game multiple times and you look at it differently every time you play. If they well, could find a way to crack that thing where you play the same game without like without putting stickers and stuff on the board but just like you play the same game but now all of a sudden you like read it, interpret a rule differently or you like go oh but what if I do break this rule and you find out that does something I, I don't know it, well isn't this like the way you're describing it sounds a bit like time stories which we played because time stories has the I time limit true. we would go in and then we didn't go revisit it but I remember us thinking like if we had played it I again right. we would have to revisit it soon because we would go back remembering like okay well that behind that door was a trap, so we're gonna go this way, and you're kind of playing it over to relearn right. where you went right and wrong. I guess the right? reason I didn't go there is because Outer Wilds is so much better than Time yeah. Stories. And because we like played Time Stories once or twice <laughs> yeah. and never went back yeah, to but it. Yeah, I guess you're right. That's so I guess, immediately I guess what came to mind. It would work as it were. <laughs> <laughs> it would All just right. be less appealing, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, go okay. to your number 10. Awesome. All right, my number 10 is uh, this was released in 1995 on the Super Nintendo, and it is, uh, I think this might surprise some people, Donkey Kong Country 2, specifically, Diddy's Kong Quest. Yeah. So, uh, my, the first, other than when I bought my Super Nintendo with Street Fighter 2, the original Donkey Kong Country was the first game I got, and I played that one a lot more, but eventually, years later, I played Donkey Kong Country 2 and was kind of blown away by how much better it was than the original. Um, this game takes side-scrolling, like the side-scrolling side platforming almost to a new level. Like, there's, there's other games that are going to be higher up on my list that do that as well, um, but 
it, it had to do with the fact that there had already been so many, you know, NES, Super Nintendo, all the Mario games, all that kind of stuff. And I kept thinking for a while, like, how much better can these games get or how much can they keep innovating? And there was a point, like, I went back, back to look just at some of the other games and Mega Man X3 also came out in 1995, same year. And it feels like to me, beyond that year, it took me until playing like Rayman Legends on the Wii, which was like a, what, 2009 release or something, right, right. to feel like blown away by a side-swing platformer again. Yeah. So Donkey Kong Country 2 took the first one, but made it better in every way. The the way that each world had its own unique like sort of identity and theme to it. Um, the soundtrack is one of the best of any Super oh, Nintendo man. game for sure. Like those, I sometimes put these on when I'm like playing board games at home so or whatever. Good. Those songs, yeah. like I get almost emotional listening to some of them because I, I'm transported back to like, my friend's house who lived across the street from me as we were like, you know, 12 years old ever trying to play this game. Um, and I went and revisited it when I worked, well, you know, obviously our friend Kevin. Yeah. When I worked at a call center a little while back and we went and we were working overnights and revisit and played through the whole game. But the aspect of, you know, the hidden like donkey, the DK coin that's hidden in every single level. Yeah. And then you've got like the animals which they took to a new level from the original donkey kong because this one you're like there's like a snake and there's like sometimes you you're not just riding the animals and some you are the animal and there's like the levels leading up to the king k rules tower at the end and then you gotta like find a certain amount of creme coins to unlock other secret areas like it just feels like it's secret after secret after secret and there's like even the levels you're on like the little um in the amusement park you're on the little like cars or whatever yeah. and you're jumping like mm -hmm. they just made you play the game in so many different ways it wasn't just run sideways and jump um and yeah. then you're like you're you're racing as like the bird right like there's the bramble blast levels and all that kind of stuff yeah. so um it's just it, it feels like the game has almost no flaws to it it's something that is so replayable and like i i just i want to go back and revisit it again um i tried playing donkey kong country 3 it definitely didn't live up to the second one uh, to me, but um, yeah. yeah, I can't remember how much you obviously played this one. I can't remember. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy. To, I for some reason I I thought you liked the first Donkey Kong better than the second one. I guess we hadn't talked about it in a long time. I just but played I, it a lot more. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I played the second one a lot more. But I always thought just like what you said, like it is better than the first one in every way. And the first one's already a phenomenal game. Yeah. So it's it's just yeah, it improved on it in every way. Like you said, the music is phenomenal. I mean, the music was great in the first one too. It has the iconic like island swing song and stuff. But yeah. like the second one has, uh, I think it is in the Brambo uh, Blast level. And I'm gonna forget the name of the song. Sticker Brush Symphony. Yeah, yeah. It's, exactly. It's I knew the, exactly. It's one of the, yeah. one of the best video game songs of all time up there. It with, makes my eyes water when I listen yeah, to it. Yeah, that yeah. one and the Moon theme from DuckTales are two of like my yes. favorite video oh. game songs of all time. Yeah, yeah. So, Corridors yeah. of Time from Chrono Trigger. Anyways, yeah, that, that's yeah. all I'll say about it, but yeah, I, a phenomenal pick. I'm really happy that made you top yeah, 10. Yeah. So. It was close to not making it, but it just, it kept surprising me. I'm like, no, I like it better than this game. It surprised yeah. me that it squeaked on at number 10, but anyways. Nice, okay, my number nine, also a newer-ish newer game. Like This is from the PlayStation 3, this came out. I guess that would have been probably like 2008, 2009, if I was guessing, maybe 2010. Okay. Um, and this is Dark Souls. Okay. So nice. yeah, Dark Souls is, is on here. Uh, you know, the, the, this game has only gotten better for me the more I've gone back to it and played it. So I've gone back to it a few different times, and I think playing some of the follow-ups, like Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, uh, um, Bloodborne, and, and even Elder Ring and stuff now, I realize just how great Dark Souls is and what for me what does and I've talked to you about this a few times is just the way they made the world interconnected. They've never they've never they didn't ever find a way to recapture that in, in the in the subsequent Dark Souls games in my opinion. Hmm. Um, and it was just that you you are in this world where in many time many ways you can kind of go wherever you want. It's not a full open world like it is in Elden Ring, but you know at the start you can go to where you're supposed to go, or you can go to an area that you're clearly not ready for. And and if you're really good at the game, if you played many times, maybe you can conquer that area, or maybe that just teaches you like without words on screen, without a tutorial, just teaches you you're not ready for this yet because you get destroyed. Right. So you kind of have to learn yourself by doing that. But every time you complete an area, or, or most times you end up either in a brand new area or in a sort of you unlock a new door, a new passage or a new elevator or stairs or whatever to a subsequent an area you were in before or, or an area you haven't visited in such a way that the whole world ends up kind of being interconnected and you kind of end up mapping it for yourself in your head by knowing, okay, like I know that I just finished, you know, the, I think it's called like the Undead Burg or something. Burg is the first mm -hmm. area or whatever. And when you finish that, then maybe you, you get into, I'm going to forget all the names of the place, but there's like the, the thicket that's underneath Darkwood Thicket or something like that. Yeah. And like you just slowly kind of like 
uncover more and a lot of times you uncover areas that you can't go to yet but it's always enticing you to be like well i can't go there but if but i see an item so maybe i can just run to the item and you try to run to the item and there's like an undead dragon there and as soon as you run to that the undead dragon comes alive and you're right. like there's no way i'm ready for this right but maybe you get the item and now you're more powerful than you should have been before and there's like there's so many secrets and so many things to uncover that it feels like an nes game in a ps3 game package in the way that like in old nes games mm. There was, there was like, it, there were, those games were a lot harder than they ever yeah. had any reason the being. Mega Man games uh, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, like the old Ninja Gaiden games yeah, and stuff like yeah. that, right? And like just the aspect of exploration without having like guides and without having like all this stuff. Like mm-hmm. there was a sense of exploration back in the day that it's hard to match now when it's easy to even by accident stumble upon like a walkthrough or a YouTube video or someone telling you something, whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, the gone are the days of like, this is how you get Mew in Pokemon because people would just be like, I'll just Google that and find yeah, out. Right? Yeah, that's true. So in Dark Souls, there's so many things that are like, you would never even expect it to be like an actual secret. It sounds like something that someone would tell you, and it's not true. Like I remember, there's my one of my favorite memories when I first played it is there's a dragon that I cannot take on right now, and he's sitting on a castle, and his tail's there dangling. And someone told me, and I didn't believe them, that if you go underneath the the bridge and you have a bow, then you have to find a way to get the bow early on. And you have to get enough arrows early on, and you just sit there and keep firing. Like I think it's like thirty arrows at the dragon's tail. Eventually, you'll break the tail off and you get a, we- a sword for having break broken his tail off mm-hmm. as if you've like a been in water with the sword and the sword is way stronger than you should have at that point in the game <laughs> okay. but again it's like these kind of secrets that like it just makes that game so special because you feel like there's always something to uncover so right. it reminded me of what it was like to play video games back in the day and that's hard to do with games these days that want to hold your hand through everything yeah so yeah. i just I, it's such a hard game it's infuriating in so many ways but i've never ha- had as much satisfaction beating a game as when i beat dark so i felt like i could like I could climb yeah, yeah. a mountain at that point. So <laughs> yeah. I love Dark Souls. It's one of my, yeah, again, one of my favorite games uh, that came out uh, sort of after 2000, after uh, 2010, whatever. Um, and I, yeah, I go back to it all the time and I'm recommending it to people all the time. What do you think is the most times you lost to a boss, like the hardest boss? Oh, it was man. like 50? Like, me, I mean, it's possible. I don't know that it would be fifty, but there's a there's I would say like the gargoyles, which is like the second boss, or uh, you go there and a gar- you're on the, a roof and a gargoyle comes down. And you're like, oh man, this gargoyle's hard. And then you find out you're not just taking on one gargoyle. They just keep there's like multiple gargoyles no, okay. you're taking on, and one was hard enough. I think I think you face two, and then maybe it's like later you face four or something. But okay. that that gargoyle fight was when I was like not quite familiar with the mechanics yet and like how to be good at Dark Souls. That must have taken me at least thirty times. Okay. I feel like, and now when I go back. Can play. I can probably beat it on the first try sometimes, right. but but it's about learning the pattern. Yeah, and, yeah it's, it's and you it, have yeah. to really be willing to like just put yourself through hell playing this game. Nice. <laughs> like yeah. honestly, yeah, these are ones that are a huge like uh, a gap in my sort of video gaming. Like again, these all came out when I had already been obsessed with board games. But like yeah. I have Dark Souls Two, which you gifted me many years ago on my Steam yeah. library. But I, you keep telling me no, you have to start with the first one. Yeah. So I'm gonna buy it on there one day and play it. But so uh, yeah, yeah, that's oh, Dark and Souls. would it work as a board game? Uh, Dark Souls has a board game. <laughs> oh, right, I guess yeah. so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, from what I understand, it's mixed, the, okay. the reviews. Uh, same thing with the Bloodborne game, it's mixed. I think some people love it and some people don't. So uh, I think, yeah, it, it like it, it, the board game they created for it was exactly kind of what I thought it was going to be. Like It's kind of like the Kingdom Death Monster mm-hmm. approach or whatever. I think it doesn't replicate the exploration. It replicates the battles and, and the difficulty, which I, is good. But I don't know but, if they ever replicated the, like... I, I think you'd have to go the full like Taint of Grail style campaign route and, and with like less story and more just like immersive world that, that's open world and you're exploring. I think that's really hard to pull off in a board game yeah. and with that same kind of like atmosphere and feel. Well, so. and like the real time battles with yeah. the music playing, like there's nothing that's going to mm-hmm. emulate that sense of like that, that epicness yeah. or whatever a little, you want to call it. A little hard right? for, for them to replicate in yeah. a board game. Yeah. Cool. Well, nice pick. I definitely knew this one was going to be on your list. But, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, by the way, I didn't mention for Donkey Kong Country 2 my last pick. Mm. Uh, definitely could not work as a board game. Um, there's just too many things that would have to that would slow it down and like of any of the games on it, that one is just like pure fun start to finish and I think everything that would make it potentially work in maybe one or two ways would just clutter the game too Platform, much. So. Platformers are hard to convert to exactly. board, unless you become a full dexterity game but then even then it's not going to be a good one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Be, yeah, yeah. It'll be something and fun I'll, for And I'll mention, I'll try to remember a tie-in uh, for something when I talk about a platformer later about that ties into board games a little more but anyways, I just realized that. So uh, pick number nine for me, a number nine game of all time. Uh, this was released in 1993, and this is Mega Man X for ah. the Super Nintendo. So, uh, just I'll just say right now, there's no other Mega Man list, uh, games on my list that are that are higher up. Um, I played a bunch of the ones for NES. Like I think I beat one through three, maybe as four as well. I, I I remember I played four, five, and six, but definitely not as much. I think I owned the first three on NES. 
some of the hardest games, again, still to this day. Like, these are the types of games where when you go back, if you play them on an emulator, like, I remember playing as a teenager and having, like, playing with save states yeah. and being, like, being able to play it like that, and then you go play it on the NES, and you're just like, Where's how did I beat states? that? Yeah, like, how did I beat this as, like, whatever, seven, eight, or, like, yeah. it makes no sense how I beat those games as a kid when you go back and try them. They're so tough. But Mega Man X was the first one for the Super Nintendo, and I did play X2 and X3, but I only beat those maybe once or twice each. So I don't know if, you know, if more plays I might like. I know people will give me a hard time. Oh, X2 is the best, X3 is the best, whatever. X, Mega Man X I played a whole bunch of times, and I love... So not only did it capture all of the things like, you know, the perfect timing and the perfect kind of like hand-eye coordination of like you have to run right to the edge of like how many times you just try and jump and the ledge is just a little too far and you don't make it and you just yeah. lose a life. And you're like, I only have two more of these and I'm already th however far into this level and I'm going to get game over if I don't. Like they're very punished. It kind of reminds me of what you're saying about Dark Souls. Not to that yeah. same extent, but some of the boss fights, like, yeah, some of those boss fights late in the game did take me for sure like 20, 30 tries getting game over, over and over and over. Like some of the most challenging games... But one of the things I loved most about Mega Man X, and again, soundtrack. This is a big. This is gonna be a big thing for me. In almost all these games, the music is like a really key factor that really made these games more immersive and memorable, and really adds that nostalgia factor when you go back and play them again, or just listen to the listen to the soundtrack and kind of you can picture the level. You can picture yourself in that, you know, in your bedroom in your old house or whatever, like playing these games. Yeah. But Mega Man X had this perfect thing where you're like, every level had something that you could only access or get if you had already beaten a previous level. So there was almost like, you, you could go online and see there's like ideal order to play the levels in where it's like you go beat, I don't remember, like Chill Penguin first or whatever because you get something from that level that allows you to beat Storm Eagle easier, that then allows you to beat Boomer Kwang or whatever. I don't know if I'm getting the order right, but yeah, yeah. there was different ways you could play it and then sometimes you'd have to go back to certain levels now that you had certain power-ups. Um, and then it's like once you get past the original set, there's like new levels that you unlock and whatever. It just, it, it felt like it was really like almost pushing the limits of what the Super Nintendo could do. And it's one of those games that you just, it stands, it, it stands the test of time. Like I've gone back and played this not too many years ago. And it's one of those ones like the graphics still look amazing because it doesn't, in the same, you know, I've complained about this before to you about how like I find it hard to go back to Nintendo 64 and PlayStation games because like just going into 3D, going back to them, it's all like kind of blurry and, and yeah, blocky yeah. and stuff. But Super Nintendo was like, mm -hmm. just like it holds up really well because it's just really, really nice yeah. like 16-bit graphics. But uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Mega Man X, uh, amazing game and I'll definitely go back and play it many more times. This is one of the, uh, there's not many, but this is one of the places where we deviate I think the most in that like I... I've, I've tried playing almost every Mega Man game, and I've like I've enjoyed. I shouldn't say like I don't, I don't dislike them. I enjoy them, but I've, they never hooked me the same way that they mm. do. And um, and I, I tried with like Mega Man Two, which is a really beloved one, and and like has some really memorable music and stuff. And same thing, I could I don't think I've ever, ever even beaten it in full because I just never was interested in kind of playing it after a certain point. Yep, Mega fair. Man X, I think, is the other one I tried the most, where I would go back to that one a lot to the point where I never even really tried X Two, X Three because X didn't hook me as much mm. as much as I wanted. But like I appreciate them. I think they're great games. I know why people love them. But for whatever reason, for me, aside from the music, I think is phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, but for whatever reason, the gameplay just would never kind of hook me the same way it hooked you. I almost, I almost, almost, I, I like watching it be played more than right. I like playing yeah, it. Yeah. Like I, when they do like GDQ and stuff, the speedrun um, events and whatnot, and you get to see people just crush these games. I think it's amazing to watch that happen. Right. Yeah. But yeah. For, for whatever reason, I just don't get into them myself as much. Fair enough. Yeah. I when I was like. When I borrowed your Switch not that long ago and played Metroid Dread, I thought of the Mega Man games a lot, especially Mega Man X, because the boss fights where you can like dash around and you're in, you're like stuck in a room with a boss yeah. kind of jumping around and it's just like that reminded me kind of like yeah Metroid Dread boss fights reminded me a bit of Mega Man mm -hmm. X um, and quickly this would not work as a board game at like even less than Donkey Kong Country 2 <laughs> because of how much it's about the pacing yeah. and timing and things like that. There's just no way it would work, so I won't yeah. even get any more into that. But <laughs> yep. All right, my number eight is a game you've already talked about, and that is Donkey Kong Country 2. Oh, man! <laughs> I did not expect this to be on your oh, list. Oh, man, this is one of my favorite games of all time. So I am I... so happy that this is on your list. For some reason, I didn't think it would no, be. No, I, oh, I've beaten this man. game so many times. I grew up with this game. I It was one of the first games that I remember getting for my birthdays. Like, I asked for it, I didn't expect to get it, and I got it, and I just played like the hell out of it um so i mean yeah there's we so gotta many, go back and play it together yeah <laughs> there's so there's so many things i could mention some of the things yeah. that you that i'll just focus on some things you didn't touch on just to differentiate yeah, yeah. it i loved the introduction of dixie I, yes. I i think that the duo of dixie and diddy felt more like even though 
Dixie and Diddy are the same size and they have a lot of like the same like weights and everything when they jump. I just loved the differentiation of the hover compared to like Donkey Kong and Diddy, which just felt like yeah. one was just yeah. heavier, one was lighter kind of thing. Um, I loved the uh, Donkey Kong Country 2 added uh, vertical uh, levels, mm -hmm. so they're like vertical swings. Some yeah, people didn't good. like them, and I've read some stuff saying that's the only thing I didn't like about it. But I actually mm -hmm. loved the differentiation of yeah. like climbing the masts of the si of the ship, or like there's the ones where you're in the beehive and you're climbing like the, the honey and stuff like, like that. that. Toxic tower with the snake, yeah, yeah. right? So Just jumping. I, I really yeah. appreciate yeah. those. I think that it does a great job of like it's surprising how many different like biomes, so to speak, there are, and like how much differentiation mm -hmm. there is in levels between like. The, the cart levels between like the the honey levels, the ice levels, the ones yeah. on the ship, the ones in the forest, like there's so much dif there's so much differentiation. The animals are all better. I think in like Donkey Kong Country One, um, Squ Squawk or whatever his name is mm -hmm. or whatever has, is completely different. In the, in, the, in the original, I think he just is like has a light on him or something like mm -hmm. that. He's just hovering around. I think so. Yeah. In this one, he's a full on character that like shoots out stuff from his beak and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Bramble Blast is one of the hardest. Uh, levels in the game, one of, one of yeah. my favorite levels in the game. The music's yeah. amazing. Gangplank, Galleon, the uh, music on the final boss fight is amazing. Yeah. I and it's a to tough that boss fight yeah. too and really fun. The, yeah. the pirate theme throughout was done really well. Like everything yeah. about this game is amazing. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite games of all time, obviously. And I just, I love, love, love this game. I've gone back to it so, so many, when, when me and my ex got together, well, that was what the, one of the first things we bonded over was we just put on, uh, I think, I think we did the first Donkey Kong first, but it was yeah, Donkey Kong Country 2 they came back the most to and just kept like playing okay, on, yeah, on my yeah. like little um, Super Nintendo right, mini, right. Mini, Super Nintendo Mini or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, amazing game. Yeah, Man, for sure I'm on that list. So happy to see. I, this is such a surprise to mm -hmm. me. This is one of those ones that I keep thinking like no one ever seems to have this on their top whatever games of all time list. Yeah. And I'm like, why is it like overlooked? Oh, so I'm, I'm so happy. Right now. <laughs> Donkey Kong Country. Okay, we're gonna play this again together Absolutely. together sometime because yeah. this is one of the only games I would say not one of the only, but one of like especially the side scrolling platformers. Usually when I play those, I want to play them alone because I don't want to miss out on playing the levels. Yeah, this is one of those ones I would happily just sit there passing the controller back For and sure. forth. You die, pass the controller back, and we're beating it together. Yeah. We're working through the game together. Yeah. Such a good game. And we already answered, probably wouldn't work as a, as a board game because it's hard to do platforms. Yeah, but yeah. That is Donkey Kong Country 2, my number eight. Nice, yeah. Donkey Kong Country 3 is kind of garbage. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> just had to throw that in there. Tiny Kong? Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay, number eight on my list uh, is the first PC game I'm going to be talking about. Ooh. Uh, so this was released in the year 2000. The version I'm talking about, I guess, was a, an upgraded patched version or whatever that came out technically in 2003, mm. but the game was from 2000, and this is Counter-Strike. Yeah. So officially 1.6 is the version I'm talking about. Um, these days I still, every once in a while, I'll go back and revisit Counter-Strike uh, Go, Global Offensive. Mm -hmm. um, this one is, of any of the picks on here in my top 10, I think this one is the most... This is the one that I think I would be most likely to see outside of my top 10 if we revisited this list in a few years. Um, it was hard. I couldn't leave it out of my top 10 though because first off this was the first like online PC game that I really really got into I think there was maybe other games that I like but I think it was like grade six or seven that I started playing this and then like all through high school I had a group of friends who were like we were always playing we were in like clans together looking for clan matches like trying to start playing like somewhat competitively in those uh, Cal whatever leagues like yeah, yeah. and stuff like that and and being on like voice chat actually like talking with people like this was a game that just completely changed my entire like perspective on video gaming. Um, and it it's of any game, it might be the one that I was the most like addicted to. Like there were like legitimately times I would come home from school, get home at like 4:30, and I would just like play Counter Strike straight until bedtime. Like I would stop yeah. to eat dinner and then just play and I'd look and like, oh yeah, I played seven hours of Counter Strike this evening yeah. after school or whatever. <laughs> Times like staying up so late playing. Oh yeah, I remember us playing until like 3 a.m. some days before. Yeah, exactly. Stuff. Like playing until the sun comes up basically. Like yeah. it was it was hard to stop playing. And, and I'll say right now, I, I wanted to make sure, I didn't, I'm glad I didn't forget this, but I'm not really into many games that are like primarily like first person shooters. There's games that I've, other games I like where like you have a gun, like something like Mega Man and some other games might come up. But um, in terms of like first person shooters, like I don't like Call of Duty games. I don't really care for like Rainbow Six, Splinter Cell, you know, even like the new kind of those like, um, like Apex Legends and, and Fortnite and yeah. I've even tried like the Call of Duty like Modern War or Warzone or whatever it's called because mm -hmm. a couple friends play it and like I don't really care about any of those games but what did it for me for Counter-Strike is I think two specific things. One is the way the weapons feel and again I'm, another quick thing is like I don't care even in real life like I don't care about guns at all like I'm not the type I would never want to own a gun I don't I have no desire to like go to a shooting range one day like I could care less about guns but something about that aspect of the game where like you, you know, like one 
precise shot to the head with like an AK-47 or the M4 or whatever is like all it takes. But if you're shooting someone in the chest or the arms instead, like the precision of the aim and the way that the guns react with the recoil yeah. is like every gun had its own learning curve. Like you had to use how and you switch guns and it's like you can't just aim for the same spot because it's going to recoil differently and stuff. And the second aspect and maybe the most important is the level design, the map design. Yep. And I'm not talking about visually how it looks, like the graphics, not from a technical standpoint, but the layout, like the timing of the way everything is laid out where you, you know, whether it's like the layout of the bomb site being somewhere, those pressure points where you want to get to because whoever gets there first, this team is going to have an advantage and there's always a different place, a different route you can take, like maps like Dust2 and Aztec and Italy and Office and, you know, they just, they transport me back and it's a game that these days I don't care to go back and play the team version where you're like trying to defuse the bomb and stuff because when I go back and play Counter-Strike every once in a while, I just play arms race because yeah. I just want to play it for like 20 minutes, get the quick like you respawn instantly, you're just getting to try out all the guns and just like yep. get in the action. Um, but yeah, it's a game that will always be like hold a very special place in my heart and like some of my best friends and I have like bonded over playing this a lot over the years. So yep. I couldn't possibly leave it out of here, but uh, I don't play it a lot these days anymore. Great pick, yeah. I, I, I played it, not as much as you played it, but I definitely have tons of memories with it as well and played it a lot uh, with you and, and going online and I have lots of memories with it. A couple quick things. Yeah. One, if you had to answer really, really quick without giving you too much thought, what's your favorite map? Dust 2 or Aztec? Uh, probably Aztec. Both, both of those are my two favorite as well. Okay, really yeah, funny. yeah. I really um, like Italy too, but I'll have to say, yeah, Aztec yeah. probably. And then funny, it actually just went free to play. You no longer have to buy it. It's, mm. it's completely free. So now nice. it's, it's got all these new users because okay. they announced that Global Offensive 2 is coming out. So they made this one free while they, oh, while they do it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, just, I just read that the other Very day. Very interesting. Okay. But yeah, great pick. Thank you. And this definitely would not work as a board game. Yeah, I mean, never... unless, unless the only thing I thought was like that one that... Uh, Seal Team Flick. Yeah, yeah but, but, that, like... but just the arms race version of it. If they found like a yeah. really quick way to do it where you have to just yeah, like, use certain yeah. things and you have to use different disc sizes and stuff. Yes, because like, I was going to say could... uh, Seal Team Flicks felt very... It, that felt more like Splinter Cell because it's right. tactical and stealth. Like you shoot and now you're alerting guys in other rooms that yeah, are running yeah. towards you and stuff. So, yeah. but yeah, anyways. Yeah, great pick. Uh, my number seven uh, is a game that is relatively newer as well. And I think this might be the last newer-ish game on the list, I think. I, I don't remember the years of all these. Mm. But it's a game that uh, I, we, I played solo and we also played together at one point or another. This is many, many years ago. And that is Portal 2. Oh, nice. Yeah. So Portal yeah, 2 yeah, yeah. is a phenomenal game. Um, it, 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 I, I, when I was first doing my rankings, I wasn't sure whether in my top 10 Portal 2 is going to make it or if Half-Life 2 is going to make it because I love them both. But to be honest, Portal 2 is the way more innovative game. And uh, for something that's for por a game, Portal, that started off as sort of like an offshoot of, of Half-Life, for it to end up be kind of coming into its own and, and doing everything it did, I think it's pretty amazing. Portal 2 is so inventive, so creative, not only in the single player mode, but also in the multiplayer mode. It's it, multiplayer it, uh, is co-op and it's its own full campaign that is just as inventive as the single player mode. Yeah. Has a great story, has great little connections to the Half-Life universe. And yeah, the, the puzzle design is so devious at times and so creative where you think like, this can't be the answer because this can't be what they want me to do. And then it works and you're like, you feel so accomplished and so great about it. Like the, the story going on, the music, the ending song is, is just as good as the one from um, the original Portal, which I think is it's still alive in the original Portal. And then I can't remember what the name of the one is in Portal 2, but they're both incredible. The ending's yeah. great. It's just the whole thing. Yeah. It's, just, it's just such a memorable experience. And it's... Um, that was, I think, the first time in a while when I played that where a newer-ish game gave me the feeling after my first finish of it that this is something special and this is going to end up being one of my favorite games of all time. Normally, yeah. it, it takes me a while to be like, I'm still thinking about that game or I have nostalgia for it now or I want to go back to it. But that's one where I finished, um, kind of similar to, to, to Dark Souls and to even um, Outer Wilds, mm -hmm. where I finished it and I went, no, that is a really, really special modern day video game. Um, just, yeah, if you haven't played any of the Portal series, I definitely start with the first one because the first one's a really short experience. So you can kind of decide whether you like the style of game it is. Um, whereas Portal 2 is a longer, more involved uh, campaign and also uh, like has the co-op mode. But yeah, just the, the 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 stuff that comes out of there, the puzzles they came up with, with the you know going through just the simple idea of like putting two portals on a wall and you go in one and come out the other, that gets expanded in amazing ways in Portal Two. Yeah. Just the gel later. Oh yeah, and like, exactly. The, yeah. Like the different the propulsion yeah. gel and like the different things. Yeah, yeah, just unbelievable game. Uh, definitely deserves to be in my top ten. That is number seven. 
Nice. Honestly, this was one that was like 12 or 13 on my list. Mm. And the only reason I think it didn't make it into the top 10 is that first off, I've only played the co-op mode. I've right. never played the single player. Yeah. And I didn't beat the co-op mode. Uh, Patrice right. and I played through a bunch of it. And then it wasn't like we got stuck or anything. We just got distracted playing something else or whatever, got busy and never went back to it. So I didn't feel right putting a game that I haven't beaten. Yeah. And I also haven't played the single player on there. But yeah, yeah say, I, I remember like having chills playing that game with him. We were just like, yeah. I need to meet the people who designed this game. Like these people are geniuses and they should be given all kinds of awards because it's like totally innovative. Yeah. <laughs> you should definitely go back and play the single player. I, the single yeah, player I will. Is amazing. I still have it on Steam. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely going to go back and play so it. It's good. one of those ones I need to revisit. Yeah. And yeah, oh man, what a, and, what a and honestly, I don't know how that would work as a board game either. I, I mean, there, there's ways you could do the portal idea in a, like, not in the, maybe the single player campaign, but a board game where one of your characters or a character has an ability where you can kind of go between two areas by putting portals on the ground is kind of similar to like the wormholes in a wormhole. So yeah, like if you yeah. did, if you did that and took that concept and made it the entire concept of a, a more like action oriented board game, I'm sure it could work. But without but. it being 3D, how do you like you know what I mean sure. like when it's 2D yeah. top down like there you you're so limited in what and, you can and, do and, and also like it's hard it, to translate the puzzle solving as well especially cooperatively way. yeah right yeah it's so a little bit tougher truly yeah I didn't have they but done they Portal could, Three or after? No, and it's a crime. They haven't okay. done they haven't done Portal Three and they haven't done Half Life Three. For some reason, they okay, just yeah. don't <laughs> want to finish these yeah fair these enough these games yeah but anyways great well, game. nice pick yeah. Okay, number seven on my list. Uh, this is the newest one. This is the one that I said, the only one that's come out in the last 20 years. This is a 2015 release. It's another PC game, and that is, of course, Rocket League. Mm, yeah. uh, this is the only... Yeah, it's the only, like, kind of sports-adjacent uh, game in here. So this, like, blew me away from the first time I played it, but has taken on new levels. Like, I I'm sure as you would... would um, uh, like agree with just like when you play it you're like whoa this is really cool and then as you start getting better at it you're like okay this is next level yeah. and then like a month or two later you're like I was a total new before now this is next level and yeah. that just keeps happening the more you play you start discovering new layers to the game and then you go like watch a video online or watch some pros play and you're like oh I'm terrible at this game <laughs> like I've gotten yeah. so much better and I would get absolutely <laughs> massacred if I went online against the pro like yeah. there's no and so I, I don't know if I would ever want to get to that point of the game but yeah obviously the the premise of like the 3v and I, I've never played like the custom modes I don't play 2v2 it's just I play the standard 3v3 um, and it's obviously a game that is much like it's best to play it with friends like playing on voice chat with people who you're actually talking to and you have some coordination with is much better than just queuing up online with random strangers um, and of any game on here I would say this is the game that has the lowest lows like when when Rocket League goes wrong, you have a bad teammate or you lose, you know, the other team makes a, a crazy comeback and you blow the lead at the end of the game or you make a mistake that costs your team. It can feel so crushing and you get caught in this spiral sometimes of like, oh, I got to get revenge. So I'll queue up again. I'll queue up again. Sometimes you end yeah. the night playing losing seven games in a row and you just go to bed pissed off. And it's like no other game on this list probably made me feel that way. Yeah. But the highs, like the amount of times I've like, screamed like in in <laughs> elation at my at my monitor being like yes like i feel like a god like kind of like you were saying about dark souls like that yeah. feeling of like you make like a five goal comeback in less than a minute and after your one of your teammates already quit the game and you're down two three and it's like you try telling people about this you're like you never believe and people are like yeah sure okay whatever yeah. and you're like you'll never be able to relive that moment. i've saved replays you go back and watch them and you can never recapture the moment like the heart racing moment in the game yep the like coordination the teamwork of like yeah there's just so much to love about the game and i think part of why it resonated so much with me was that as someone who has played like soccer my whole life like it's the only sport i really ever played competitively um but the sense of like positional awareness and anticipation and teamwork and stuff translates surprisingly well because i could see people would get frustrated playing games with me because I, like i couldn't go like you know the the flying in the air to hit the ball around stuff like i was so behind like the level that i would get up to people were flying in the air doing that stuff and i was like terrible at that part missing the ball all the time but the other aspects of like my sort of anticipation and knowing where to be kind of made up for it. And it's right. it's just a really interesting game, the fact that you can be, you know, you can play goalie really well and suck at everything else, or you can be a pure goal scorer and not do anything else. You can just be the setup guy, always knocking the ball in front of the net. Like, yeah. there's so much to love about the game, and I think it's one that I've, I've already played probably like, I don't know, at least 100 hours worth, and I only discovered the game a few years ago. Yep. Um, yeah, I love Rocket League, and obviously it's one that we, I hope to play with you a whole lot more. Yeah, we play it a bunch, and I, I expected this being your top 10. I, I wasn't com 
completely convinced whether it was going to crack it, but I thought it would. Um, it, it's in my, like, I think it would end up in my 11 to 20. Like, it's, it's definitely close. I love Rocket League as well. I've played tons yeah. of it. Um, I got it right when it first when it first came out. It was released as a free game to anyone who was subscribed to PlayStation Plus or whatever, mm. like, back on PlayStation 3. And so I had it way back then, but, like, I didn't really have anyone to play with at that point. I was kind of just, like, dabbling in it. It wasn't until I rediscovered it when you got into it and I realized how good people had gotten at it that, you know, yeah. then I really wanted to, to uh, uncover it more but yeah phenomenal game for all the reasons you said the highs when you have those amazing comebacks or you have like as for me it's it's the big saves are the best yeah part of the game, the game. <laughs> yeah. Like, what a save yeah exactly <laughs> you have your whole team doing the what a save yeah job. yeah uh yeah amazing game well uh, and one of the best uh for i think if, for me one of the absolute best multiplayer like online multiplayer mm-hmm. games uh that i've ever played for sure for sure and yeah. the and the, and the, the physics based aspect that kind of goes back to portal 2 as well is yeah. just like so well done it's just yeah, yeah. It, it makes no sense that the game works as well as it does yeah. i didn't expect to like it that much and it was just completely floored so and yeah. it absolutely would not work as a board game yeah yeah i know i mean <laughs> the timing and everything the thing in 3d like the sort of rocketing up and the like there's no even way. if you try to do it like you wouldn't be able to replicate the verticality of it that's no, where it would no. all fail yeah uh all right my number six is a game that this, this one is the only one that I, I like i don't i do know which entry to pick for this because i have most of my nostalgia and stuff tied to the first entry but Hands down, the newest entry is by far the best one. So I, I think based on just mm. mechanics and gameplay, the newest one is what I put on here for the Switch. But based on my nostalgia, I want to say the one for the GameCube, and this is Animal Crossing. Oh yeah, so, I figured this would be like here, yeah. Animal Crossing New Horizons by far the best one. It, everything it introduces you can pretty much customize the entire island. If we had access to this when we were uh, playing on GameCube, I don't know if we would have ever left the house. Like, <laughs> like we both would have owned it. We both would have like you could customize everything. You can like. Yeah put rivers down like it, it's terraforming the entire world basically so like wow. it, like it, it's hard to say that that's not the best one but all my nostalgia is tied to us like doing the most ridiculous yeah. things and getting going like getting so elated over something as simple as oh my god like kk slider is playing tonight and you, <laughs> what are we going to request request from him and we request the song we're both sitting there listening to a virtual dog whistle and we're like Man, this guy's so good. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's ridiculous. I don't know why we latched onto it the way we did. Or like, I had a villager in my town named Bob, and we used to love Bob oh, yeah. to cat, death. Yeah, yeah. We used to just be like, man, what's Bob up to today? And we just like, go yeah. check out Bob. Like, for whatever reason, yeah. this game landed, and it, it, it kind of ignited my love of like, simulation games like that. Like, the, mm. re- the relaxing simulation games. And I think the way I feel about Animal Crossing... And, and others do is kind of the way that a lot of modern in the modern day a lot of people are feeling about Stardew Valley. Stardew mm-hmm, Valley is a mm-hmm. game that is kind of scratching that same itch. For me, yeah. Animal Crossing will always be the, the pinnacle of it because of all the, the nostalgia I've tied to it. And the new one is just yeah, it's it's better in every way. Like it, it improves on everything. So I think I'll, I'll probably say Animal Crossing New Horizons. But know that whether it's this one, whether it's the DS one, the GameCube one, like they're all amazing. They all kind of scratch that same itch. And there's nothing quite like. Just booting it up, knowing you don't have any like, you know, major things you have to calm. It's just a relaxing game where it's like, what do I want to do today? I just want to talk to some villagers. What do I want to do today? I just want to, you know, go and try to work towards getting a windmill in my town, or I want to go and try to unlock the new store in my town, or upgrade the the grocery yeah. store because I'm buying more stuff. Like it's just these little tiny micro things that you're doing that you can play Animal Crossing 20 minutes a day, and yet that's all it kind of needs to be. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's a different. It's almost like what you would expect people to do on their cell phones, but way more involved, and you don't have to do it on your cell phone, right? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, amazing game, and I think every entry that comes out until I'm probably like 90 years old, I'm gonna be buying and playing because I'll never not be relaxed by playing Animal Crossing. Yeah, man, I. I I missed out on the newest one, obviously, but I have very fond memories. And I never owned the one for GameCube, but obviously I have very fond memories of playing that with you and just watching it. That's another one. I would just watch you play, and then you would watch me play for a while, and like... You get pissed off because Tom suddenly renovates your house and charges you money. Like, I didn't ask for it. You can't just go over and renovate my house and leave a bill. Like, I didn't hire you for this. And people, like, giving you rumors about, oh, there's something that's, like, buried. You know, there's treasure here. And it's just, like, taking your shovel and just digging out every yeah. spot. And, like, there's Collecting so... all the fossils for the museum. Yeah, and All the yeah. fish and, and for, the, for, your, for the museum, same thing. All the bugs. Like, there's just so much, yeah. so many collectibles to go after. Yeah. And the fact that it's real time and changes by the season means that you're always yes. incentivized to come back, right? Yeah. So yeah. And come back on Saturdays for Cake Yeah, Slider. exactly. Of course. <laughs> every Saturday. Wouldn't you change the clock in the game? Yeah, on GameCube, I would. Yeah, yeah we'd be like, like, it's on Saturday, but we need some KK slider in our life. <laughs> oh, so uh, good, so good. Okay, I gotta, I gotta revisit those. And yeah. you mentioned board game. 
This one, I mean, Stardew Valley, Stardew Valley, Stardew Valley became a board game. Apparently it was pretty good, too. I, I could see a, an Animal Crossing board game, but I think you'd have to find a way to re replicate. Like, you'd have to have it be, like, four rounds over the seasons so that you have all the seasons mm, represented. Right, you'd have right. to have, like, yeah, I don't think you'd be able to recapture the same thing I love with Animal Crossing, but I'd be interested to see them try. That's fair for enough, sure. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, cool. A great pick. And one that I did expect to see on there. Okay, okay. number six is a game that I think think you're going to have on your list as well and if not I imagine you'll have a different one from the same series potentially. I'm not going to give it away. Yeah this is from 2001 one of the games I became most obsessed with most addicted to in, ever in my life uh, for the GameCube Super Smash Brothers Melee. So uh, I played the one for N64 initially which is where it came out and to, like played that to death with friends for years um, and then once Super Smash Brothers Melee came out it was like I almost didn't even want to go back and play the N64 version because Melee seemed like it improved on it in every way. Uh, the, by far the best like fighting game I've ever played. Like again, that that also this is the type of game that made me almost like not care about like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat in those games yeah. too. Like very different style <laughs> of games. It's not really maybe fair to compare them, but having like that kind of real time fighter where like the characters are so unique and tied into like our favorite video games too. Like it felt like something that again shouldn't work as well as it did. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I bought and, like, again, Super Smash Bros. Brawl for the Wii also played that one to death. But that one felt like a halfway point where, like, the original was kind of, like, slow and was a little more, like, you know, the frame rate would, would drop a little bit and it wasn't quite as, like, sharp, I think. And then Melee had, like, it was so fast-paced, such high skill level, like, you can't make mistakes, people make you punish, like, or punish you for them kind of thing. The one, Brawl was still really good, but it kind of went away from what yeah. I really loved about Melee so much. And then I, I think I played, whatever, the Wii U one or, or yeah. Ultimate a couple times. But anyways, the 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 amount of times, like, obviously our favorite, favorite characters were both Sheik, yeah. right? And we were just the, the 1v1 Sheik battles, just like, how many <laughs> hours do you think, how many, like, potentially hundreds of hours do you think we spent just doing 1v1 Sheik battles? Yeah, how many? Four, four stock I'm, on uh, Final <laughs> Destination or whatever, like, yeah. Kirby's Dreamland and stuff, like... Or how many hours did we just spend doing that bubble that bubble thing where it's just like soup, 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 back yeah, and forth, yeah, like just that yeah. alone trying to dodge yeah, whatever each other. it's called shield dash yeah, or whatever shield dash. I can't remember yeah yeah the yeah. oh the and the, these were games that like of any games we played these were ones where I felt like we at the time like obviously now you see the pros and you're like okay I wasn't yeah. quite as good as no, I thought but yeah. at the time like we felt like no one in our friend group could beat us beat us at this game <laughs> yeah. when we're chic playing for, like with no items like get all the randomness yeah. out of here but. Anyways, there were so many characters that were fun to play. It was Samus, Link, uh, you know, Mario. Like, there's just so many things. The uh, the uh, meteor smashes where you could jump off the ledge and punch someone or knock someone like straight down out of the level. Yeah. Like, it was even so fun just much. unlocking all the characters and seeing which yes. characters were going to be in it. And yeah, stuff. yeah. yeah. The, I, w I wouldn't go back to the single player mu much once everything was unlocked. Yeah. Like, obviously, yeah. we played it for the multiplayer. But yeah. yeah, amazing, amazing, amazing game, and one that I like would love to go back and play again someday yeah. because it's been so long now. Yeah, I will say that melee. It was either like thirteen or twelve. It was like right in there. Oh, I, it okay. Just missed. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't expect that, to be. All, I, I wanted to include it, and and it was so close, but it was just yeah, some other ones had to go ahead of it. But yeah, fair I, enough, I, I have all the same. Like, it, it's just as treasured to me, and I have just so many of the same memories with it, and I love it for all the same reasons. I've had, the amount of times we like, had, like, birthday parties, different, like, different gatherings where we would have little, like, little Smash Brothers tournaments yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Like, it was just, it was so much fun. They had it in our, our lunchroom at my high school, and you, mm -hmm. you would go there and play, and if you kept winning, you, like, whoever won got to stay, and the other three people had to uh, rotate out. So if you kept right, winning, you right, kept yeah, yeah. keep playing. And so yeah. that was always a fun thing to do. So yeah, I mean, it's such a great game. Yeah. I love it. And this is one that I think, because, like again, you've played a lot more games that have come out in the last 10, 15 years than I have. And I think if I'd played a lot of the ones that I know you have, this would probably also bump out of just outside my top 10. I don't think right. it would stay there forever kind of thing. But yeah. yeah, it was hard to leave off based on how much of an impact it's had on me as a gamer. So. Yeah. Oh, and it absolutely would not work as a board game. <laughs> There's no way to, yeah. I wouldn't even really start going down yeah, that, yeah. that path. So tell me your number five. Into the top five now. Yeah, so things five. get extra extra juicy here. Number five is a game from the GameCube. I think it's like 2002, 2003, somewhere around there, if I had to guess. Um, it could be 2004, and I'm, not, I'm forgetting which which years it is but uh one of it's an rpg but it's uh, a, a different kind of rpg it's a nintendo rpg and it's by far the my favorite one in the series better than super uh, super mario rpg and that is paper mario 2 the thousand year door hmm. 
Uh, this game is, I mean, I love Super Mario RPG. That would probably end up falling in my 11 to 20 range, I would guess. It's um, right, yeah, right there. Yeah, right there on the shelf. <laughs> uh, but Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is a phenomenal game because it combines everything I love about that style of RPG with like the timing-based attacks and, and you know, the interesting battle system. But it combines it with such a whimsical, amazing story. And I don't mean an overall story. The overall story is, I mean, the overall story is better than a regular Mario game. It has like, you know, interesting characters and some a little twists and turns, but I wouldn't say that that's what I mean. It's just that every chapter has its own contained story. And those stories are so well written and they're so different. Like the places this game takes you are places you never expect to go in a Mario game. You're not going to the Mushroom Kingdom. You're not going to, you know, the places you're familiar with from all the other mainline Mario games. You're going to brand new locales that don't look like they belong in a Mario game, but they find a way to fit it in, and you don't know what to expect. And the main hub area is this like rundown town that is like you know uh, susceptible to like thieves and and all these like mm -hmm. uh, graffiti and all this stuff going on. But there's so many secrets just in the town of like when you get different abilities, suddenly you can like turn sideways as paper and slide down grates, and now you can unlock new yeah. areas of the town. And it's like cool. it, there's there's just so that part's amazing, but then the actual, like I said, the, the stories that are going on, I remember like one of the stories, the entire thing takes place at a wrestling event, the entire chapter, and you un you like you find different rooms to go into and different things like that, but you would think like, how do you do an entire chapter of this RPG at a wrestling event, but they make it work, and there's this like mystery going on that you're uncovering too, and there's one that takes place entirely on a train, which I think is like my favorite one mm. in the entire game, like one on, takes place on an island, like... It is just such a varied experience. It, it improves on everything the original Paper Mario set out to do. In my opinion, it improves on everything Paper Mario or, or uh, Super Mario RPG set out to do. It is the pinnacle of the Mario RPG series for me, and I'm waiting with bated breath for them to, to do another one like this. We've had other, other Paper Mario games. None of them have recaptured what they were doing here. Hmm. They kind of gravitated away from the RPG style and kind of uh, put that RPG style onto the Mario and Luigi series uh, that started on GBA. But I hope they come back to it because it, to me, it's never been beat since this. And I, I heard that there was a rumor that they were going to re make this for the the switch or for something like that and, mm. and i was like hey like that's a great remastered or whatever i like... think i think it sounded like it was gonna be a full remake i don't know whether okay. that's that's the case i think it was really just a rumor based on some listing but it, i'd be happy if that happened but really i would just love to see a full-on sequel to this done in this style because i have so many fond memories of this game damn yeah. I, I i figured this would either be on your list or just outside the top 10. this is one of those ones that i really want to go back and play more because i only played either first chapter or maybe the two first chapters I think I either rented it or bought yep. it from you like many 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 years ago yep. and I remember being totally blown I was like I you know I as I mentioned at the start of the video I haven't been too like into like turn-based RPGs in the past yeah. and stuff um, but yeah this is an amazing game from what I played and I really want to go back and play yeah, play more so of it good. so that's number and five it would not work as a board game I imagine I mean yeah I mean you the th thing with being paper and sliding through like the the Depth, like I don't the feed, know. Depth, field depth or whatever. What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. I don't know that it would work as a board game. You'd have to kind of abandon the pa trying to do anything with the paper style and just really focus hone in on the RPG elements and kind of like try to have like a more kid friendly campaign out of it. But I don't know. I, at that mm. point, why even bother? Just make just make Paper Mario three at that point. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> or fair like enough. There, are, uh, there has been a Paper Mario three. I mean, an actual sequel to this game yeah, specifically. Yeah. yeah. I will say I'm surprised though that this was ahead of Super Mario RPG for you. Yeah, I, I mean to be honest, I was a little bit too because I always used to put Super Mario RPG on my in my top ten. On the, I'm talking like years ago when I yeah, did do yeah. my list. But the more I, I I've gone back and I played both, mm. and really I just think that like this one has aged better than yeah, Mario RPG. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Yeah. All right, number five on my list is also in the Mario universe. This is a 1990 release. Oh yeah, it's the greatest game ever made with Mario in it, and that is Super Mario World mm -hmm. for the Super Nintendo, of course. Man, the amount of t oh, th this really takes me back. The nostalgia that even just thinking about the game, the again soundtrack i've talked about it with a bunch of these other games the soundtrack in these levels is incredible um the fact that you had yoshi and like being able to actually like fly through levels with yoshi you had your your cape to fly through levels um there's the world is just like there's secrets everywhere oh, like yeah. the i don't remember what the butterball bridge or whatever where you go down like the little waterfall the water, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think, that's, that, I think that's the one where you have to like, I mean, I'm not going to really worry about spoilers. This game came out like... Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I think that's the one where you have to actually fly under the exit yes. yep. to get to the secret For exit. For so long at the that end. That blew yeah. my mind. Like, exactly. Blew yeah. my mind. Yeah, I remember the first time my brother showed me that and I was like, what? How, <laughs> how did anyone figure this out? And I'm, I'm pretty sure at the time he was like, I had to call the Nintendo number. And like the one, in, the number is like my parents got mad. They're like, what are these charges? It's like, I needed to find, I heard about the secret. Um, the way the world changes too, like on the map, it's not only the extra levels that come out, like... Yeah. You you know like there there's the levels with I don't remember what they're called like the different color um, like dots were like the yellow and red dots yeah with the exclamation mark like those oh, levels where you, the, and they would the open up to a new yeah the yeah. switch stations or whatever that open up new areas <laughs> and now there's blocks that are populating in different yeah. levels that weren't there before like the way the whole thing changes and then even when you get to again I don't care about spoilers this game's been out for <laughs> 23 yeah. years or whatever um, when you get to the fight like Bowser's Castle or whatever it's like there's the back door entrance right like there's all of these different things that are just secrets littered everywhere and just like the music, the each individual level design, all the different enemies too, like the end credits where it's showing, like yep. there's just, it's pure fun, it's pure nostalgia. And I acknowledge that part of it might be nostalgia because I haven't gone back and played it recently, I guess. But, but no, it's it's but it's just an amazing I think so too, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. Like when I think about, you know, I've gone back and played Mario 1, 2, 3, and Super Mario World, all yep. at least within the past 10 years at some point. Yep. And the other ones I acknowledge are still really good games, but I don't have the same desire to revisit them as I do with Super <clears throat> Mario World. Yeah. Uh, and I will say, I've always heard people say that Super Mario World 2, uh, Yoshi's Island or whatever, is apparently really good. Uh, for some reason, I never played that one. I uh, I, it's just a huge yeah. oversight on my part, so I can't really compare the two. But yeah, yeah Super Mario World to me is still like... Well, yeah, I won't... I won't. <laughs> but amazing, amazing game. Before I even say anything more, I'm just going to say my number four is Super Mario World. Okay, nice. Okay. I knew <laughs> so you were going to have, have it. I can okay. talk about yeah. this really. I knew you were going to have it on your yeah. list, but... Uh, so right yeah. there with you. Uh, yeah, so... I mean, we didn't even talk about Star Road and how amazing it felt oh as a kid to, like, God, unlock the pieces of Star Road. Road and not only realize that you have to beat those levels, you have to, like find the secret exit to each of the Star Road levels to yes, reach the final star to go exits. to the secret area that has all this, the hardest levels in the game. Yep. That was yep. amazing. Um, and they're all called like amazing and marvelous yeah, exactly. and spectacular yeah. and gnarly and whatever. It's yeah, one of those yeah. games that when you play it as a kid and you get, and especially in the time, I think that's one of the things that you know is, is important to remember for the people that are watching this that maybe didn't grow up in a time with the in, without the internet and stuff, mm. is that like back then you can't just like be like, I'm getting frustrated. I'm just going to go search a YouTube video or a guide and see how to beat this. Yeah. Like, unless you're calling a phone number or unless you have a friend who's done it, you have to just figure it out yourself. And so as a kid, figuring out to fly under a secret exit or figuring out that secret exits exist in the game yeah. in the first place yeah. is such a revelation that you feel like you have this secret that is now, you have to go tell everyone because like, guess what I just found. Mm -hmm. So you, whether it's at school the next day, whether it's at your friends on the weekend, like you're sharing this information. It's it's not only nostalgia, it's, it's a thing we just can't replicate now it's true i mean yes it's you can true. stay off the internet and stuff but in some ways it's, it's it's different like games are built differently with that knowledge as well so super mario world as yeah. a kid uncovering those secrets and trying to find all 96 exits and then or just beat yeah. the game straight up like there are so many amazing moments in that game and even though in some ways i could probably make a case to say that super mario galaxy's gameplay or super mario odyssey's gameplay is more refined or better. Super Mario 64 is more refined or better than some of the things Mario World did. It's 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 hard to separate the what Mario World did for that genre and also that this inherent nostalgia and that um, you know the the uncovery of secrets that just cannot be replicated in the yeah. games that I'm, like are the newer Mario games that come out now. So yeah, an amazing amazing game and one that still holds up. Like I can go back and it is not aged. In, in a negative way, like I can no, go back. The graphics and that still and look amazing. Yeah. The soundtrack's amazing. It's the total package, right? Yeah, it's such a good game. That's my number four, and that's your number five. You said it, right? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Right. I thought it was yeah. both have four, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And again, yeah. for the same reason as like Donkey Kong Country, I don't know that this could really work as a board game. As something no. like there's, I, I think about mechanics that maybe could, and I think like something to do with the secret exits. Yeah, um, and the overworld map yes, layout and stuff, that yes. could all work, yeah. yeah. And and I don't know if you knew this, they, they finally did try to replicate the world map aspect of Mario World in, in a future Mario game. Super Mario, new Super Mario Brothers U for, for the Wii U mm. and the Wii U on the Switch went back to a uh, overworld that will, would morph and change as you uncovered secret exits and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And that was one of my favorite of the new Super Mario line because of that reason. It felt right, it right. felt like it was the closest they got to going back to Mario World. Right, so. but still nowhere near, right? No, like it's it, just, it can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. It can't replicate it. Yeah. So, yeah. Game was ahead of its time. That's my number four. Nice, very nice. Uh, yeah, and honestly, for if you had asked me like five or ten years ago, it was probably in my top three, but the more I've thought about some of these other games, they've just, yeah, yeah. wormed their way a little bit ahead of it, but yep. 
Okay, number four on my list is, wait, is this? Yep, it's the last, it's the highest ranked. It's my favorite PC game of all time. It's something I haven't played in years now, but I definitely want to go back and revisit it. So this came out in originally 2002, but I'm going to specifically focus on the expansion, which came out in 2003, and that is Warcraft 3 with the Frozen Throne expansion. So this is one of those ones that um, when I was looking through to refresh myself and looking at other people's like top games of all time, it was like I never saw this mentioned. I'm like, yeah. why was this game so underappreciated? Because I played other RTS games. I tried uh, StarCraft, StarCraft 2. I tried, you know, obviously I played WarCraft 2 before even number 3. Oh, yep. I tried, you know, Age of Empires, a couple different ones. I tried Command & Conquer or whatever. I think that's what it was called. I tried a few of those and none of them lived up to what WarCraft 3 was. And for me, WarCraft 3, part of it might have been the fact that it was around the same time as Counter-Strike. It was a little bit, I think it was a bit just after Counter-Strike that I got into WarCraft 3 right around the beta. But... Um, the aspect of, so obviously Warcraft 2 just had the two races, humans and orcs. And then Warcraft 3, when they added Night Elf and Undead, that just blew the game wide open. Um, it was absolutely incredible. And and just the, the different map designs and the fact that you have your, the fact you had heroes, right? There weren't heroes in Warcraft 2. The fact that you had a hero or you pick from a starting hero and getting that, the, the timing of the builds, it was a game that had a very like competitive scene, obviously. Like this is... I don't know if this was one of maybe the first games or around the time when like streaming and like tw like watching people play games on Twitch and watching like commentary of replays on YouTube even like became popular. Like Grubby was like one of the best war uh, orc players and he was doing commentary. Um, I'm going to give a real special shout out here uh, to Chumpesque. Anyone who liked Warcraft 3 or Frozen Throne, go type in YouTube Chumpesque and go to his YouTube channel. Best commentary by far. Uh, the guy was so passionate and knowledgeable about the game for someone who wasn't even a pro. But um, anyways, the aspect, yeah, picking those different races and learning the ins and outs of like, there were just so many different strategies. And even if you followed like the meta of the game and it's like, okay, well, they built their base this way. So they're probably going with this hero and you know they're probably gonna go like math huntresses or they're gonna go with you know bears and dryads or they're gonna do whatever build there was always the like the opportunity to surprise someone the comebacks in the game were just absolutely incredible like even years and years and years after playing it i was still every once in a while running into a strategy that i'd never seen before someone beat me with uh, an acolyte rush one time and, with, and I looked at the replay and I watched they'd built a second necropolis in their base I'd never seen someone build a second necropolis at the start of the base and rushed me with acolytes and I don't even remember what hero and frozen throne is what took that game to the next level because so many new heroes they introduced the tavern heroes so now you could with any race you weren't just limited to the three base heroes not only did they add a fourth hero for every race but you could go to these taverns on certain maps and pick from a roster of like I think it's 10 different heroes then you had the mercenary camps where you can go hire mercenaries and buy items and like the game just had so many levels um and i haven't even mentioned the single player campaign like i'm talking all about online right now the single player campaign i never played through start to finish but like the cutscenes were amazing and ahead of their time the 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 actual like missions or whatever were really fun and really challenging so i'm going to go back and play through the single player again i don't know how much i'll ever go back to like the multiplayer because uh it can be very unforgiving when you're rusty with all yeah. the, t the the timing of the builds and stuff but um yeah just incredible game i could talk about this for so long I, i've had like the, there's not many games i've actually had like lands like gotten together with friends been like they bring their computers over to like my my first apartment the amount of times like uh, a couple of friends would come over and we just like play warcraft 3 in the same room with each other yeah, like yeah. anyways incredible game um and there's nothing quite like it for years we kept saying i remember if there was one game I wish they would design for like 10, 20 years, I was saying like Warcraft 4, Warcraft 4. Yeah. <laughs> and then they released Warcraft 3 Reforged and apparently it was just yeah, atrocious. Garbage. Anyways, uh, I'll leave it at that. But um, yeah, I'll let you say something before I mention the board, whether how it ties to board yeah. games. It's a, it's a game I, I really, really enjoyed. I, I never got into the multiplayer scene. So the thing is, is like all my memories are with the single player campaign, yeah. which I think is like, I got into the story, I got into the lore and all that stuff, which is kind of what gravitated me towards World of Warcraft and why mm -hmm. I got into mm -hmm. it. So I have tons of fond memories of the single player campaign of this and the expansion having played through it all, but I don't have the same tie to it because I didn't get into multiplayer and I, or that same mm -hmm. hook that I would come back yeah. to. Yeah. But I, I knew that there was a competitive scene. I knew how, people, how much people got into it, um, as well as all the mods and stuff that came out I was going to so say, it's, uh, yeah, I'm like. not surprised it's on your list. I, know, I didn't know it was going to be that high, but I thought it was going to be in your top 10. Yeah, fair enough. And just for anyone who's a fan out there, I played random because I liked all the races and I liked the aspect of playing a different race all the time. Rather, I wasn't in the game to just like perfect one race. I liked the element of surprise uh, against the opponent and stuff. 
Uh, anyway, so how this ties into board games. Of any game here, this is the one that I think could work best as a board game. And I'm gonna give a shout out right now to the solo mode specifically of Cloudspire. Mm. Cloudspire in general, uh, I've done a full, we've done a full review on the channel and we've spoken about it in other videos before. As a game, it has four races and each one has like, there's three heroes for each race, right? Yep. You have your starting base, you have, like there's so many aspects, you have your specific units that work differently from the other races and specifically the single player campaign uh, of Cloudspire worked in a similar way as the solo or the single player campaign in Warcraft 3 where you start with run one race you play through a certain number of scenarios I don't remember if it was four or six and then when you're done then you move on to the next race and it's a way to kind of learn them all while getting unique aspects of the game and they're presenting you like a challenge that you think feels impossible the first time and then you have to kind of overcome it and um, I haven't gone back to Cloudspire since we did the review because it's a pretty heavy rule set but I've kept it around specifically because there's no other board game that has ever made me think of Warcraft 3 in the same way that Cloudspire did, so. Yeah, um, that's a great yeah. call up. Agreed. Anyways, that's it. All right, my number three uh, is a game that came out, I think it's like 91 or something like that for the Super Nintendo. It is my favorite game in the Zelda series and it is Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. Nice. Uh, so this is, uh, it is the closest any Zelda game. I'll, I'll just game. say right now, this is also my number three. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I knew it was just because I don't want to have to hold back on sure, this. Sure, both but, yeah. our number three is great. Yeah. Double and crossover. also my favorite Zelda. Yeah, full yeah. crossover. Um, so yeah, it, it has come close. Some other Zeldas have come close and I will say that um, A Link Between Worlds, which is kind of like the spiritual successor, successor to this game, is a game I absolutely adore and and I've beaten 100% like three times because of how much it uh, reignited my nostalgia for Link to the Past. But I don't think it's a better game than A Link to the Past. I just think mm -hmm. it, do it does a really good job of recapturing that magic. Yeah. Link to the Past is just, for it, for when it came out, it's a it's a it's phenomenal how much that game set the bar for yep. Zelda games, for adventure games. There's games still re, like copying that formula now because of how well it works. It's such a grand game in the sense that like back then it wouldn't have been that surprising for you to have finished the first three dungeons and gotten and then beat the wizard and been like, oh, I just beat the game. And then all of a sudden- you And go been to the... very satisfied yeah, with it at exactly. that point. Yeah, exactly. And then instead you go to the dark world and you have seven more dungeons to do. And now you realize that like, there's this dark and light world aspect where you have to like see how, how what's different between the both. Uh, and that and just, also yeah. set the precedent between, you know, the the young Link and old Link in uh, Ocarina of Time. And, and they've done it in subsequent Zeldas as well. Like that whole like dual aspect of the same world has yeah. come into play. And other games have tried to do that as well and none have lived up to the way that yeah, Link in the Past did it. It's such a fun game. It's, it was, as a kid, I know it's, it's easier now when I go back to it as an adult because I play it so much and because I'm just like more experienced mm -hmm. as a gamer. But back then it was it was a challenging game and and, ha and I beat that when I was pretty young and I remember feeling pretty accomplished uh, having done <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all the secrets too. It's not just about being the game. Oh. It's, it's figuring out like, it's coming across something and being like, how do I do this? Or wonder if this is something or or I'm gonna have to come back here. And then, you know, whether it's figuring out how to get the flippers to, to go in the water or yeah, figuring out how to get the, flippers, the yeah. ocarina in the forest uh, or, uh, you know, like how to get the the book off the shelf. You have to use the the, yeah. the boots to, to ram yeah, into yeah. it. Like, or there's things. the fairy fountains that you can throw certain items in and yes. the fairy throws them back. But there's certain locations where there's a couple of items. I think one is your shield and one is something else where if you throw it in, she's like, oh, I have this other upgraded version yeah, for you. And yeah. you're like, oh my God, what? <laughs> I just threw like 17 items in here and this one actually worked. Yeah. It actually upgraded. I know, like there's you're just like, so many yeah. amazing little things to latch yeah. onto. It, it recaptured. Yeah. It, it's one of the best examples of like secrets back in the day and like having to like talk with your friends and figure out like what's going on and and it's just a full it's a full Zelda game like it's it Zelda yeah, one it's... is is monumental for like introducing Zelda but Link to the Past in many ways is the thing that most Zelda games foundation wise is built on like mm -hmm. so many things from that one are still done in games now um, that you know yes may have been introduced in the original Zelda but re really weren't refined and done right yeah. into Link to the Past so it's hard for me to ever think of a Zelda being Link to the Past like, I know people for some people that is Breath of the Wild Breath of the Wild is an amazing open world game it's an, just a good Zelda game to me I don't think for me a Zelda game is a certain thing and I think the Breath of the Wild is a great evolution for the next genre or sorry next generation of gamers but for me, I love that old old school style of Zelda and it is so well encapsulated in Link to the Past. Yeah, and I, I haven't even played Breath of the Wild, full, uh, full disclosure. Mm -hmm. uh, I really want to, um, but I also don't expect it to, to you know, beat this out. But um, 
I think a lot of people are gonna be surprised that we don't have Ocarina of Time here. And I know we've mm -hmm. both played, I actually haven't beaten it. I, I My brother borrowed uh, it from a friend many, 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 many years, like when it first came out and I was up to the Shadow Temple and then one day I went down to my brother's room to like pick up my save file and the game was gone. And he's uh -huh. like, my friend asked for it back. And I was like, what? Is that the Shadow Temple? Are you kidding me? I had no warning that it was going to be taken away from me, and I just haven't had the motivation to like start mm -hmm. it over and go through the whole game again. Um, but even then, like, yeah, there's it doesn't it wouldn't live up to Link to the Past for the sense. Link to the Past just feels like it has no there's no fluff, there's no filler, there's no times where I'm like playing the game and feeling like oh it takes me long to get to where I want to go or that I don't like this dungeon or that this like quest I have to go on or whatever. Like from the moment you. There, there aren't many games that throw you right into the action and make you feel the sense of like adventure right from the start. Like you wake up in bed and your uncle is like, it's the middle of the night and your uncle's like, I have to go tend to something. Yeah. And you just like pick up your sword and you go outside and it's dark and raining and you go follow him into this dungeon and it's like, it, it, you can't match that feeling in another yeah. game. And then you come out and it's all light out and you look at this map and you're like, this world is massive. Yeah. There's all these areas you can't get to and you just yeah. look at your item screen and it's empty. There's nothing there and you're like, what else is there left to uncover? And then yeah. like, yeah, all the dungeons are just incredible. The bosses, yeah. yeah. In, Amazing uh, yeah. game. Yeah. No, I don't think, I can't imagine a Zelda game will ever match this yeah. for me. And I will say that I think it could work as a board game. I think the way they would have to do it is they'd have to just approach it either as a co-op game for two players or full on just a single player game uh, that is built in a campaign style. Kind of like the... The Iridia game that just is either right, just coming or coming yeah. or whatever, yeah, yeah. Um, or any of those campaign games where it needs to be a lot about it being like an open world feeling exploration where it like just like um, a link to the past, so you're kind of can go where you want, but you're going to encounter things you can't do yet, and you have to like make notes for yourself. Like if I laid out a game like that on the table that I was just experiencing, and I could have that sense of discovery and go around and discover things, and they could find a way to make you know combat work in a, in a way that doesn't detract from the exploration, I would be fully on board to trying it. I think it would be hard, but I think they could do it. I think it would be an interesting thing to try to do. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know if I would be as eager to play it yeah. only because of the the fiddliness of like how do you explore a map without having the full map unfolded like right. are you turning pages of a book and then are you like revealing things and covering them back up and then like if you save the game and come back to it how do you right. pick up where you left like there's just so many things that would yeah. be tricky and I think that would get in the way of the experience yeah, which I, yeah sure. I think you probably agree with that right yeah, like, yeah. for sure um, okay, so yeah, that was both of yeah. our number three. Man, both awesome. number threes. As if we had, yeah, Mario there World there one will, apart and Link to the Past. There will not right be there. crossover in these two, I guarantee you. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> What's so your number two? My number two is a game that used to be my number one for a long, long time. Oh, until, of course I know these two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> until until I played them again yeah, yeah, and I realized yeah. that my, my love lied somewhere else for number one. This is the game I have probably the most nostalgia tied to. Uh, for many years, this was the, like this was my childhood, and that is a game called Final Fantasy VII. So Final Fantasy VII was the first Final Fantasy game I ever played, which for a lot of people I think is the case. I think a lot of people kind of, it, this was their introduction because it was the first one that was really marketed in the US a certain way and they really tried to say we're bringing Final Fantasy to North America in, in, a, in, a, in a big way that we're going to attract a new audience. And they did with me. Uh, I started by renting this game like seven times, multiply just to continue my save file before my dad surprised me and bought it for me. Nice. Um, I have beaten this game. I would probably hazard by saying like 20 times in my life. Like I, I play through this, if not yearly, uh, you know, every year and a half, every two years. Um, obviously it was remade and I played through that. I played through the remake twice already. Uh, it, it's just such, it, it is the pinnacle of, J, close to the pinnacle of JRPGs. And there's just, the, the story is great. There's tons of twists and turns to uncover. The the extensive of exploration and like visiting all these different towns. There's there's characters that are optional characters you don't even have to get. This So like you can have one playthrough you didn't even get two characters. And back then, like when you don't know that, you all of a sudden find out your friend has this other party member and you're like, where'd you get that party member? And he's like, I went into some forest and I got into a random battle and they wanted to join my party. I'm like, what? Yeah. And so now you want to start and you save file and go get this right. like the, the way I, that I played it back then was just wanting to experience the story and explore compared to now where I, I play and I try to like hone my party and le and grind certain levels and and say you know how do I want to build this party and which one which characters I want with this magic or these summons mm -hmm. or whatever like I played I played differently almost every time I go through it it is so memorable for me in so many ways the aspect that it had three discs back in the day was like, oh my God, this game is so big, it needs to be on three CDs, yeah. which now it's like a CD has 700 megabytes, like yeah, games yeah. put onto one disc, no problem. But yeah, it, it is just, it is my childhood in many ways. Like I, I, I think Final Fantasy VII, 
and I think playing this with, with uh, one of my friends who had it as well, I think just sitting in my room and like getting lost in this game, getting lost in, in, in multiple save files at a time because I got stuck and I wanted to start again and I was too young to realize I could I could just grind and get past a boss. So I'm like, I must have done yeah. something wrong so I have to start again. Like the first disc especially, I have so many memories tied to that that like the, um, the, the remake is based on like a small part of, of the first disc and that's the part that I have the most memories of when you're in Midgar at the start of the game and, and yeah, like I, I can almost, I could, I could sit here and I could tell you exactly what happens on the first disc in order without missing anything because of how many times I played through that game. Yeah, so yeah. characters are memorable, the story is memorable, the locations are memorable. That entire game, I'll never forget this game for the rest of my life. So that is Final Fantasy VII. Used to be my number one, and it's been recently, I would say, in the last ten years or so, it's been beats. So. Wow. Yeah, this is one I've never... I might have played like the first hour or so of it, but it was one yeah. of those I watched you play a whole bunch, mm -hmm. obviously, as a teenager. Yeah. And uh, of any game that I've either pl like haven't played or haven't played much, I feel like I know a lot of the big moments just because yeah. like whether it's through <laughs> you or stuff on the internet, the yeah. big moments of like Sephiroth and all these characters and stuff that yeah. are just like... Uh, yeah, I can appreciate it as an iconic game even though it didn't really... Not something I Latin really got you, into. Yeah, yeah, yeah just sure. because the whole turn-based RPG aspect. Yeah, but, it's harder for you. Yeah, yeah but um, not surprised at all to see this mm -hmm. here on your list. Okay, um, and so, yeah, you did mention the board game thing, no? Okay. I didn't, but yeah. I, I, it's hard to translate JRPGs into board games. Like, again, like you can find a way to do the combat like you've done in like, uh, like Kingdom of Death Monster and Dark Souls and even like uh, some of the other campaign games like Gloomhaven, but it's not the combat that's necessarily the reason I love the game. It's the world building, it's the exploration, it's the towns. You'd have to make a campaign game, and at that point, I don't know whether you're translating this the right way. So. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. But that might have, the, the love of those types of games, something like Final Fantasy, might have some re like connection to why you like games like Gloomhaven yeah. so much, right? Oh, the aspect 100%. of like, yeah. you know, going on this adventure, leveling up your characters, yeah. finding new characters that your my, party changes along the way. I'm all, a right? campaign game lover because of this game and my number one game, 100%. So yeah, okay, cool. it, you could make it a campaign game and I'd probably get it just because of my nostalgia, but I don't know that it would do it justice, but I would just say, yeah, my love of campaign games, this is where it comes from. Nice. Yeah. All right, my number two game of all time, uh, the last Super Nintendo game on this list, the greatest Super Nintendo game ever made, 1994 release. You know exactly what yep. this is, of course. I didn't know if it was going to be your number one or not. It was yeah. my number one for like <laughs> so, so, so long, but not not quite anymore, mm -hmm. uh, and that is Super Metroid. Yeah. Um, the, like, I, the first Metroid game I played was the one for NES, and that Metroid has... I was thinking about it when you are talking about Dark Souls, because the original Metroid has that aspect of, like, you just, like, shoot through a door and you walk into this room and a bad guy flies into you and you lose, like, two energy tanks. You're like, whoa, okay, you just, like, leave the room and you're like, I'm not supposed to come to this area yet. <laughs> Super Metroid wasn't quite that unforgiving, but it was yeah. still a very difficult game, and uh, there's not many games that can match the... It, it, again, feels like the total package of, like, the music is just, like gives me the chills, is so nostalgic, you're isolated, alone on this kind of planet, and you start off with pretty much nothing. Like, you just, you're just running around, you have a gun, it's not, like, I don't, and this is when I was talking about Counter-Strike, about shooting games, why I didn't want to spoil this, but, like, I don't think of any of the Metroid games as shooter games. Like, to me, yeah. they are exploration games, but you need your gun or blaster or different types of gear to get through this world. And so, like, yes, you can kill things with your gun, but it's not about the shooting. It's about the exploration. It's about the sense of uh, immersion and, like, the story that builds without having to read text on the screen. Like, there's no dialogue. The You kind of just learn about the world as you go. Um, and... For the time too, even just the, the way the map works, like when you look at your map and you can see, you know, the size of a room, but aspects like part of the room that you haven't gone to yet is like in black and yeah. you're like, okay, there's a, a higher part to this room and I know that I'm going to be able to access something later. You can see these like things on the wall and you're like, I can't use them now. Later you find out you get a grapple hook that allows you to latch on and then suddenly you're going and accessing it opens up this whole other area that you didn't even know existed before. Yeah. And you know, you start off, yeah, just running around with your little blaster and you jump once and that's all you can do. And then later you can drop into a little ball and you can kind of roll between these little nooks. And then later you get bombs that allow you to like blow things up and also you can ball like jump with your timing these, these yeah. bombs and whatever. And you get power bombs, you get x-ray visors that allows you to see through walls and you're like, whoa, I can actually go through that spot that I thought was just a solid wall. Yeah. Like the amount of, we were talking again, Super Mario World and, and Zelda did this too, Link to the Past. And I think that's why those three games for Super Nintendo are all so high up for me is that aspect of uncovering secrets, exploring the world, and again, this game is like one of, you know, like for single player adventures, again, it holds up so well. It's a game that I've gone back and beaten probably 
similar to you with Final Fantasy VII, like 15, 20 times before. Yeah. Every couple of years I go back and play it, it holds up incredibly well. Uh, the boss fights, like, and when you get to the end of the game and you've got your screw attack and all these other things, you just feel like so overpowered. It's yeah. it's so satisfying just tearing through rooms, just like cutting through things and like, oh, the music, everything. It's, it's such a nostalgic game for me and yeah. uh, one I will probably play every few years, like probably until the day I die, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't play Super Metroid when, when it came out and when I was young, like I didn't get into the Metroid series. My favorite Metroid game is Metroid Fusion, which is, mm, is a very similar right. style of game to Super Metroid, to be honest. Um, like that, uh, it was a 2D style. It has a lot of the same mm -hmm, graphic mm -hmm. style. Um, but I, I went back later on. I played Super Metroid. I, I totally see why like people love it, why you love it, why you have this connection to it. If I had played it back when I was like when it first came out when I was that young, and I and if I had been into some of those more action games at that time, I think I might have had the same attachment to it as I right, do right. with them now because I love Metroid Fusion, I love Metroid Dread, which just came out and has that yep. same style. Yep. Like, I, I love. The, there's a reason that they now call it. It's it's, it's a genre. It's Metroidvania because yeah, Metroid yeah. and Castlevania are iconic in that way, and and it, they're being replicated to this day. So yeah, yeah. and the Castlevania me. games are great, but there's a reason why it's Metroidvania and not uh, Castle Castle Droid. Droid. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. There's a reason. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, Super Metroid. Just if if you haven't played it for some reason, just go give it a shot. Yeah. Get an emulator or something. Yeah. And and this is probably one of the. Maybe, I don't know, you, you know better than me. Is this one of the games that kind of like made speedrunning popular? Uh, I don't, I mean, or it, maybe not one I don't of them, know if it's, it's the one that made it popular, but I know that it's the one that they almost always feature as like the, the ending game at, at the uh, big GDQ events they do. And right, it's, right. And they, it's always that they have people donate on whether you're going to save the animals or not save the animals. At the end. <laughs> you got to save the animals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's an iconic speedrun game in the same way that like yeah. some of the Mario games are for sure. Yeah, cool. Um, and and we, uh, I I think we've discussed this before. I think it could work as a board game in the same way that Link to the Past could, where it mm -hmm. wouldn't be a, like, the best way to represent this game. But I think the idea of playing a game where you have to like unlock, get more powerful as you go in a single player adventure that's kind of like campaign style, and you unlock abilities. If they did it with like a map that you're exploring, found a way to have that be revealed, I think it would be interesting. I'd be down to like explore that. I don't know that it would work, but I'd definitely be. Yeah, interested. I don't know the the intensity of the boss battles and, and <laughs> yeah, the music. That would be a the music is bit. also so True. yeah essential. And the one thing that's like Link to the Past is top down view, whereas this yeah. is like a side scrolling platformer. For sure. The greatest side scrolling platformer ever yeah. made, in my opinion. <laughs> but uh, anyways. Setting enough about my number two. What's your number one? Number Actually, one. No, your number one is. Tell, yeah. them, tell the people what your number, number one is. Number one game of all time uh, is the uh, many things I'm going to say is uh, a lot of the same things I said for Final Fantasy VII because it's in the same series and it came out I think three years, four years later, and that is Final Fantasy IX. So Final Fantasy IX uh, is a game that I always loved, but I didn't really. My appreciation grew and grew and grew the more I played it until I one day played, replayed it and realized. This absolutely, I like it more than Final Fantasy VII. And that's because this is by far the game that is the most uh, of a comfort game to me. In the same way that you put on a comfort show mm. or whatever, this is something that as soon as I hear the music when it starts up, as soon as I get into the world map for the first time, as soon as I explore the village of Dolly, which if you play Final Fantasy IX, you might understand what I'm talking about there, and you hear the music and you just kind of feel like you just feel like, oh my god, I love this world already. Because every location, whether it's Lindblom, whether it's Dolly, whether it's Treno or however you pronounce it, like they all have their own feel, but they all feel like this place that you just I, I could live in. Like I just want to set up shop there, live there, and just and just like people watch and enjoy the locales and stuff because they're all so inviting. And there's like it, it, exploring the world map in Final Fantasy IX is way it was my favorite out of any, any Final Fantasy game. There's secret towns and villages and stuff that you can find. The secrets on the world map, doing the Chocobo Hot and Cold game to unlock some of the the wet the secret uh, items, weapons and stuff. The the storyline, all the character development for all the characters. Vivi is like my favorite character yeah, out yeah. of any <laughs> Final Fantasy say. game. Uh, yeah. Everything about it, like every I played this game almost once a year. And every single time I do, I get a warm feeling inside that no other game comes close to replicating. I can, it, this is one where if I was having in a really, really bad mood or, or having a really, really tough time in my life or something, if I just put this game on and play, I know it's gonna at least bring a smile to my face because I'm remembering all the memories of what, this was the first Final Fantasy game I ever beat. I played mm. seven first, okay. but I beat nine first. And I remember- Before eight? I, oh yeah. I beat, oh. I beat nine first, and I remember beating nine and the elation. And so I think that is also tied to it. And just a funny little story, I'll add and then I'll be done. I specifically, last year, no, two years ago, went on a date with someone 
only because they told me, and I shouldn't say only because, like, <laughs> that's, that's really bad. Not only no, because, no backpedaling. But I just mean like what put me over the edge was they suggested to me, after we had talked on one of the dating apps, uh, that we get together here and we just, because she had never played Final Fantasy IX and I would just watch her play Final Fantasy IX. Oh so God. we sat here and I watched her play the intro to Final Fantasy IX. We never saw each other again. It didn't work out. There was no chemistry. <laughs> But one of the coolest dates I've ever been on, oh, watching man, someone funny. play Final Fantasy IX. Oh my god, that's hilarious! I have probably never been. I, I was not. I won't even say that. Anyways, Final <laughs> Fantasy IX is great, and uh, if you're looking for an interesting date idea and you love Final Fantasy IX, just play it. Play it from the beginning. It's a great idea. That's nice. It's my, my number one pick of all time. I don't think this game will ever beat. I think this is a game I will play every year until the day I die. Damn. Yeah. This is of, of all the Final Fantasy games. This is the one I played the most of. Uh, after watching you play seven, eight, and nine a whole bunch for years and years, I remember like well, you probably remember too, right? Because I played it on your PS2 or whatever. Yeah. I got up to I think the third disc of Final I Fantasy remember. Nine, yep. and I didn't even really want to play seven or eight all that. I think I tried them and couldn't get into them, and nine hooked me in as well. Yep. The characters, the story, yep. the way the combat worked, like. Yeah, everything about it um, was super impressive to me, and I can totally see why it's your number yeah. one. And, and it almost surprises me that other people have seven higher. When I see nine, when I've watched you play and I played it myself, it kind of surprises me that seven. People I know it's the nostalgia, but yeah, people have six higher, people have ten higher sometimes. Like yeah, I don't. It, I will say this: the creator of Final Fantasy, Hironobu Sakaguchi, he has said his favorite Final Fantasy is Final Fantasy Nine, and that's because when mm. they made it, they said they were making a love letter to all eight games that came before okay. and it really is that it encompasses Final Fantasy like that is Final Fantasy more than any other Final Fantasy game is in my opinion fair enough yeah. it seemed very imaginative whereas yeah. the 7 and 8 seem more like not not real world but yeah, like seemed... steampunk and yeah, like yeah yeah, yeah 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 for sure cool all right, you know what my number one is. I do. Yeah. yeah. So uh, <laughs> this originally came out on the GameCube in 2002. I almost cheated by picking a different version of the game. I'll just say it right now. This is Metroid Prime. Um, so obviously, the number one and two games are Metroid. Just number one and two are Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then we had Link to the Past yeah. at three. Um, so if I had to pick the specific version would be on the Nintendo Wii when they released it in the Metroid Prime Trilogy because that had the upgraded Wiimote controls which I preferred over the GameCube controls. Mm -hmm. I thought about just putting the Trilogy disc on here with Prime 1, 2, and 3 but that's kind of cheating and also 2 and 3 aren't in my top 10 as separate games. So right. it is Metroid Prime and this is one of those games where when it was announced I was almost scared um, that they were going to ruin the Metroid series, right? Yeah. Because up to that point, it had all been 2D. It was all side-scrolling. It was all platforming like that. And it, like, I, I don't think I was alone. I think like everyone was like, how can you possibly take this game into 3D, right? They had already done it at this point with um, Mario and Zelda, right? They had done Super Mario 64, and they had done uh, Zelda Ocarina of Time. Yep. And those were amazing, but there's a reason why there was no Metroid game for the N64, right? Because I think for the longest time, they're like, how can we do this? We don't want to, you know... Uh, release like an in inferior version like we have to do it right and when it came out it like I can't yeah that there's I don't think I've ever had that feeling playing a video game for the first time because the it matched there was like a sense of familiarity there's they obviously know who they're catering to and there was the you know the slightly different versions of the of the songs for example like when you go into the Magmore Caverns and it reminds you of like whatever it is Norfair or whatever it is in, in Super yeah. Metroid and you know the first time you get to the Fendrana Drifts and you see Ridley's shadow fly over and you're like oh my god Ridley in this I mean you saw Ridley at the, the yeah. space station at the start or whatever um, but the fact that it managed to take a game from 2D into 3D and make it so that it was still that sense of isolation. You're still you're alone on a planet again. It's a completely different planet this time, Talon Four, um, and you land there, and it's a similar idea where you have pretty much nothing, and you're going through a world, accessing a bunch of areas where you see things you can't get to yet, doors you can't open. Um, you know, you just feel very limited. You don't have a lot of life, and you're just exploring this world, getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But the sense of exploration in this game uh, is still something that I haven't really come across in any other games. The sense of immersion where you're just like you're behind the visor and when you're in gunfights or, or battles and you just see like Samus's reflection on the visor yeah. for the first time and it fogs up yeah. when you're in the caverns and stuff like that. Uh, the boss battles were so epic. They gave you new upgrades you'd never seen before. Like with the, uh, the morph ball, you had the spider ball that could latch yeah. onto stuff. The way they incorporated that with bosses or like, again, and the fact that it goes in 3D just changes the sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking like, the... The, the geometry and the layout of like what you what is possible with level design yeah. and I still stand by I've I've you know any even games that came out 
later on the Wii and stuff, to me, never looked as good. Not, I just want to be clear. It's not the technical aspect. Obviously, there were consoles that were more powerful and that kind of thing. But it was the architecture and the design and the layout of these areas that was so unique because it's not... It's not like going through somewhere you're seeing things that are in, in the real world, right? These are alien planets. Yeah. So to come up with the, even just the, sh you walk into a room and you're like the shape of this room and there's like this weird half pipe because later on in the game you're going to be able to go in morph ball mode. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, who comes up with this stuff? How is it possible? And so yeah. like the world itself of Talon 4 is probably like one of the best aspects of the game, yeah. not to mention all the other things that just pull you in and give you that sense of like, that. that's the type of game I revisit, same thing, I go back and revisit that once every couple of years, I've played it start to finish many times, gotten 100%, and it's one of the, it's the only game that puts me in the mindset of like, when I'm playing, I, I basically like forget about the rest of the world around me. Like I'm basically like, there's nothing else in my mind. I Any worries that I have just go away and I'm just like, I'm glued to the TV. I am Samus, I'm behind the visor in this suit. Um, yeah. And one quick thing, last thing I wanna say about it is the fact that you, you learn the story through your visor and yeah. it's optional. So you don't have to, if you play it again, it's a, you don't have to sit through cut scenes or choose what to watch or not to watch. Like you have the visor and it's like, if you don't want to scan, you know, that dead body on the ground or that thing on the wall that tells you about how this soldier died or what happened to this group of people on this planet, you don't have to. You can just skip through it and you can race and speed run, but you can also take your time scanning everything, putting together these little pieces of lore and just piecing together what's going on in the world. And the more you do, the more you're rewarded for how like rich the story is and how like, yeah, engrossing the whole thing is. So yeah. Metroid Prime 2 was great, but it, the whole light world and dark world thing, it kind of uh, stole from Link to the Past, you know, had some parts that I didn't like quite as much. Yeah. And Metroid Prime 3 was a little bit too easy. And also it took away the sense of immersion because there's like other people on the planet with you and stuff. Right. So to me, Metroid Prime still stands as the definitive kind of Metroid game. Agreed. And I haven't even played the remastered version that just came out recently. I, like, I was going to say, specifically the old one. people are saying the remastered version is the definitive version. It has motion controls, it has upgraded graphics, it retains everything the original had. So like, in many ways, yeah. it, it, this is the best time to re-experience it because you can play it on the newest console and potentially the best way to play it. So hopefully this is like, you, uh, Metroid Prime 4 is supposed to be coming out sometime soon. Yeah. Hopefully this is, uh, with how good the sales were of Remastered, this is them realizing, man, we have to really keep putting out Metroid Prime games. Yeah. So, and when they, yeah. basically, however many years ago that was, where they said we're scrapping the development of Metroid Prime 4 and starting over, it was, yeah. I was simultaneously crushed, but I also thought to myself, I have to remember it's probably this for the same reasons why they didn't rush one out for the N64 because yeah. they know what the standard is for this series and they want to do it right. So I'd rather wait it out and get a better game than have them rush something that I'm going to be disappointed with. So Agreed. Anyways, and this would not work as a board game. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way you could be behind I, the I won't visor. add too much here because I've, I've, play, I've played it, but I, played, I got hooked on it much later than you. I couldn't get into it the same time you did. And I, right. I but ha having gone back and beat it, uh, I think it was on the re-release on the Wii. Mm -hmm. I think I played through, I don't know if I did the second one, but I did the first and the third one. Um, I have a, a strong appreci appreciation for everything you said in terms of world building, in terms yep. of like what it did for that like first person exploration job. And I feel like so. this was one of those ones that when I was into it, you were watching me play this similar yeah. that I was watching you play like Final <laughs> yeah. Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts and those for kind sure. of games. Like, yeah. yeah, anyways. Great game. That's it. Those are our picks. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, we would love to know in the comments if you did, because if you want to see other videos in the future, it's something we'd consider doing, like, you know, revealing some of like our 11 to 20 picks or just doing other uh, videos in the future to kind of deviate uh, from board games here and there to talk about some video games. I know Braden would love to do that too. So if yeah. you love this content, if you like just hearing us talk about other gaming topics as well sometimes, let us know in the comments mm -hmm. and that we will know that we can do more of them. And let us know your favorite, yeah, favorite games of all time as well. Like yeah. your top five, top 10, which, what's the game you go back to every year? We'd love to know. And based on our picks and you know what we kind of like and don't like now, like if there's games you think that you, we haven't played or you're wondering that we've kind of overlooked these, like please throw suggestions our way. We're always, you know, looking for, for the hidden gems we might have missed. So Absolutely. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.